are the consequences of hardening the heart? We know from scripture that the word harden or hardened is used a number of times. It's not a good thing. And we, we, uh, most Christians are familiar with the Old Testament where God hardened the heart of Pharaoh when Pharaoh was not letting the people go. And we also see in that, in that context, that portion of scripture that Pharaoh had hardened his heart too. So you see both things, God hardening his heart, Pharaoh hardening his own heart. And one of the reasons why God hardened Pharaoh's heart was to multiply his signs through Moses. Uh, God is going to make sure Pharaoh, all of Egypt, and all of his people know who's in charge, who is king, and he's the one. God is the one who puts kings on thrones and takes them down. And if you're going to harden your heart and think you are in charge, it's going to hurt. And so uh, we also see in Hebrews 3 and 4 where the writer of Hebrews says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as they did in the provocation. Meaning that the Israelites themselves, after, after God had his way and Pharaoh and all of Egypt was just demolished, because they hardened their hearts. Uh, after that happened, the Israelites are in the desert and the Israelites themselves are having a hard time believing God. In fact, they even wanted to go back to Egypt of the fear and unbelief. And so hardening your heart is, uh, is fear and unbelief. And when you don't believe, your heart gets harder. And, when you, and if you sin against God, your heart gets harder. In fact, I've mentioned this a number of times through the years in healing videos that, that if, you are, if you're a believer and you're getting entangled in sin, yeah, you're going to experience the discipline of God. God is going to bring his discipline and his correction into your life to turn you away from that sin that you're beginning to practice. The issue with sin is that of practicing sin. It's not that of stumbling in sin. It's that of practicing sin. Because stumbling in sin also implies uh, that of repentance. Like a person who stumbles in sin is somebody who's also repenting because that person recognizes I've sinned, Lord, forgive me, I missed, I missed the mark, please forgive me, I, I know I'm better than this, and then you move on. So you're not practicing it. Sin. But practicing is that is somebody who's hardening their heart. They're hardening their heart to the correction of God, and that's not a good thing. You're, you're on the path of total destruction. In fact, we know that's the case with the Israelites in the Old Testament, where they were hardening their hearts in the desert, it says that they could not enter into his rest because they had hardened their hearts and, that, and it was considered unbelief. They were, they were unbelieving. And so I believe full well that those so-called Israelites, those so-called believers are in hell. They're not in heaven because they just didn't believe. They didn't trust God. And that was the way you, in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't appeared yet. And so so believing in God meant that you trusted him. You believed that he, was, he, he existed, that he's a good God, and that he rewards people for doing good. And it's, it was all about righteousness. If you, if you were a wicked person, you're going to hell. If you're a righteous person who sought after God's honor and doing the right thing, you're, you're going to end up going to heaven. You're proving that you believe in Jesus. In fact, it's even the same thing with Jesus. It, it's, excuse me for stumbling there. Uh, we're not justified by the keeping of the law of Moses, but it doesn't mean that we're going about breaking the law of Moses. We're doing the right thing in the eyes of God. In fact, Jesus, in the, uh, in the, at the end, in the judgment, there's the, the sheep and the goats, and the goats are people on his left that didn't do the right thing. It was, it was what they didn't do. And then, and then the sheep on his right were the ones who did what was right in his eyes. So it very much is a do gospel. You're not justified by your own works, but it is a do gospel, meaning that when you truly believe in God, it is going to move you to do good works, to do what is right in his eyes. And so let me go over to the New Testament right now with Mark 6 to talk about uh, this whole thing about hardening your heart. Mark 6 is uh, the story, there's a lot of things going on in Mark 6, but one of the things is that of the feeding of the 5,000, which is in all four Gospels, actually. If 
And I'm focusing on Mark because there's a scripture verse at the end of this story I want to mention. Uh, so in Mark 6, we see Jesus had sent out the apostles to cast out demons, heal the sick, cleanse lepers, all that. And they, the apostles come back with great results. And they're, they're immediate, it's, it, it seems to be implied in scripture there, Mark 6, that they get back and they're automatically like busy. They're, they're busy ministering to people, doing this, doing that, whatever Jesus has them doing. And they're so busy that they don't even have time to eat. And so they go all day long with no time to eat. And we get to the end of the day and Jesus has been teaching multitudes the entire day at least 5,000 people, right? At least 5,000 men plus women and children. And he says to the apostles, uh, because it, well, the apostles come to Jesus and say, uh, the day is far spent, send them away so they can go buy food for themselves in the villages. And Jesus says, they don't have to go away. You give them something to eat. <laughs> now, this is an important point because we, the apostles, they're not spirit filled, so they don't really have that power yet. You know, when the, when somebody is born again and spirit filled, Jesus Jesus said, "You will you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, okay, and then you will be witnesses for me." And uh, so they're not born again, but nevertheless, there's accountability because they've been with Jesus every day up to that point, seeing great miracles. He's teaching them, and. And this is one of the things he's teaching them. When Jesus said, you give them something to eat, he, he really did mean that, but he wasn't expecting them to do it themselves, a great miracle, because he already had in mind what he was going to do. But nevertheless, he said that to them. And I believe it was like a foreshadowing of the point that when we know who we are in Christ, we do, we're going to be, we're going to be doing the things that Jesus did. And it's unfortunate that there's, there are many people in this world who identify as Christian who settle for a Christianity that doesn't, uh, that doesn't have them working in the supernatural, ministering in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is a very, very dangerous place to be, in my opinion, because there are scripture verses that support you not making it in the end if you are not exercising the gifts that are in you like for instance like the guy who buried the talent in the ground and gave it back to the master when he returned and the master uh, called him a wicked lazy servant take that take that talent away from him give it to the one has 10 i think and then uh and, then, and cast that wicked lazy servant out into the darkness with his weeping and gnashing of teeth there's evidence scripturally that that you are fooling yourself. You are deceived if you call yourself a Christian and you are not ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's also other scripture verses that, that say that every, every Christian has gifts. There's a lot of Christians will use that excuse. That's not my gift. They cite 1 Corinthians 12. Well, 1 Corinthians 12, when it talks about different the different gifts in the church it's it's talking about the context of the church when you are in the group setting of the the fellowship of believers there are many gifts in in play there and so each everybody can exercise different gifts ministering to each other uh, so it's not saying that that you are you're not responsible if god is going to use you a certain way god will use you any way he wants to and I've said it over the years many times, it's, it's not me doing it. I, I know it's not me. I don't know how to do this. I just know that Jesus is in me and that he will work through me to set people free in any way he wants, with either healing, words of knowledge, a prophetic word. And I've, gotten, I've, I've used all of the gifts in the setting of, uh, of, of ministering in the, in the Spirit's power, including the interpretation of tongues. I can remember using that a few times, not often, but definitely a few times where I felt like it was coming to me. And so, uh, and so uh, the, the apostles, even though they weren't born again, I got off track there a little bit, but it's all good. The apostles weren't born again. They were there's still an accountability because of all they saw up to that point. And, but Jesus, nevertheless, wasn't holding them accountable because he's the one that multiplied the food. So... So he says, so what, what do we have here? And so the apostles bring five loaves of bread and two fishes. 
And they're wondering what the how can that, you know, how is that going to feel all these people? And so Jesus has them all sitting down on in on the grass in groups of fifties and hundreds. He he takes the food, he thanks his father, he blesses it, breaks up, divides it, and the apostles distribute it. Now remember, the apostles are tired and hungry. <laughs> and and there's one more thing also. Not only are they tired and hungry, but they also have the burden upon them of knowing what just happened to John the Baptist. Because in Mark 6, we also see that John the Baptist was beheaded. And so the apostles, Jesus and the apostles are aware of this. Jesus is not fearful, obviously, about it. But the apostles, it doesn't say the apostles are all fretting over that. But the way the apostles were and how they weren't born again and how they were still doubting, even with everything they were seeing, I have no doubt that it affected the apostles in an adverse way, that that was something that was on their hearts and minds, that that here they are doing all this stuff, serving the Lord, and John the Baptist was just beheaded. And so, so anyway, they're tired, they're burdened, they're fearful, they're doubting, and they, they do this, they, they feed all these people, and then uh, right after that, Jesus is, he, go, he goes with them onto a mountaintop. In, in, in Mark 6, it doesn't say the, the, that the apostles went onto the, mountain, onto the mountaintop with Jesus. But in one of the other Gospels, it says that. Because, because after Jesus sent all the people away, it says in Mark 6 that, 6 that he sends his, apostle, his apostles out on a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. And then he goes up on a mountaintop to pray. And, uh, and so in one of the other Gospels, it says that they're with him for a little while as he's teaching them, and then he sends them on a boat. And so so the point is, though, is that Jesus is, is he's on the mountaintop praying all night. And so, like, around the time of dusk, which was what, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock in Israel? I'm not really sure, but it's probably, it was late. It was right when it was getting dark. Jesus, Jesus is on the mountaintop praying all night long, and he sees, he sees the apostles, they're, they're, they're rowing a boat across the Sea of Galilee in the pitch dark, the black, the only light they had is if the moon was shining that night and the stars, which was, which was probably a decent amount of light, because back then there's no pollution, <laughs> right, so like, you're seeing all the stars, you know, and so if you live in a city now, it's like you're, you're seeing only a few. But man, when, when you're not in a city, I can remember one time I was in Montreal, in, up in like the, the, the foresty area of Montreal. And I can remember one night, it was like, man, star, so many stars in the sky. It was so beautiful. And so uh, that's giving you light. So anyway, they're, they're in the middle of the sea and there's a storm. There's a great storm on the sea and they're rowing and getting nowhere. In fact, they've been rowing for at least six hours because it says that in the fourth watch of the night, so Jesus is praying all night long, no doubt for them and everybody else, and he sees them straining at the oars, getting nowhere, and so he he, he leaves them out and he starts walking on water. <laughs> and this is the same situation where Peter walks on water, but that's not mentioned in the Gospel of, of Mark it's mentioned in another gospel. Mark's gospel is really Peter's gospel, so that's probably the reason why Peter left that out when he was telling Mark what to write there. Uh, so, in, so in in this in this gospel, Mark, Jesus walking on water, he gets to, he gets to the boat, and they all see him, and they're all terrified. And uh, and and then they they he says relax it's me and then he he gets into the boat with them and immediately the the storm calms down and the apostles are all they're amazed they're they're just amazed beyond beyond measure it says and then here's the verse that I want to point out here the very next verse verse fifty two Mark six verse fifty two it says right after that the storm. He's walking on water. They're all amazed. It says, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So why would Mark, or Peter for that matter, why would he write that at that point? Because they're just, they're just experiencing this trial. They're exhausted. 
they no doubt they did eat something because when Jesus fed the multitudes, they were also eating from that too. But before that, they went all day long hungry and doing all that work and knowing that John the Baptist was just beheaded. And then, uh, and then they're, they're, they're thinking they got to feed all these people. And then they're in this storm. So like, no doubt they're, they're, they're ruffled and they're, they're just having a hard time believing everything that is going on concerning Jesus. And so, and so Jesus is trying to like, uh, get them to, you know, to believe in every situation. In fact, later on in Mark 8, we see Jesus where the apostles are also doubting again, uh, where Jesus says, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, I believe. And then, and then they're discussing amongst themselves, what does he mean by this? Is it because we have no bread? <laughs> and Jesus says to them, how can you be saying or thinking it's because you have no bread? Don't you remember the 5,000 that ate and how many loaves that were left over and then the 4,000 later on another miracle and how many ate. And so he's, so the apostles are still, even after seeing those great miracles, they're still doubting and wondering. They're not, they're not realizing the main thing that Jesus came to do. He came to show us all so much more than what this world offers. This world is, is, is lame. This world does not believe this world has a, a system that's perishing, but the kingdom of heaven is so different, and it's it's a miraculous kingdom, and we have power in us, not just to see great miracles, but also to multiply food and multiply anything else that needs to be multiplied for that matter. I have no doubt about that. Jesus was teaching us an example of what, what's in us and what's for us, and so, and so it says that in verse 52. It says, for they had not considered the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. And so the question is, why was it was their was their heart hardened because they didn't consider the miracle of the loaves? Like, and that word considered, that word considered there means to like understand, but it can it can also mean uh, that they didn't really ponder it. They didn't put much attention to it. So either they didn't put much attention to it when it happened, or they can they didn't really consider it, meaning they didn't understand it. They thought about it, but they didn't understand it. And so, so were their were their hearts hardened because of the fact that they didn't understand it, or they or they didn't they didn't cons or they didn't really think about it at all, or or was it because of the storm? Did, or rather, did the storm happen because they didn't consider the loaves? Because they just get, they're just experiencing the storm. Jesus calms it, and then it says in verse 52, for they had not considered the miracle of loaves. So that, it's just really kind of weird as to why it would say that right after that situation. And, uh, so it, it can also uh, lend you to, to think that, uh, that the storm happened because they didn't consider the miracle of the loaves. You understand that? So there's... There's any number of reasons as to why their hearts were hard. And I, I tend to think that it's because they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't really put enough attention to it. They, because of the fact that they were tired, they went through so much already, they were burdened, thinking that they were next to have their heads chopped off. And so they were, and so when you're in a situation like that, when you're really tired and so much is going on, you have a tendency to not really think too much about things. Uh, and so I think it's, it's at least partially that, that they weren't really paying too much attention. And so their hearts were hardened. And so it also brings up another point that, uh, that the devil, it's very possible and likely that the devil can bring a storm into your life if you are hardening your heart. If your heart is hardened because of unbelief or fear or doubt, he can bring a storm into your life and just make things worse. And so, so it really is a war. And I was, in fact, I was telling that to a father and a son yesterday in the gym. I was in the gym and uh, I'm, I'm working at next to this father and son. And I hear the son just saying that he, he couldn't lift any more weight because his shoulder was hurting him too much. And, uh, in a, yep, his right shoulder, and and uh, and so I just they were talking about it a little bit, and but I wasn't feeling the power of God, and, and so it was so just kind of like when I was resting in between sets, I was thinking, Lord, should I pray for him? 
So I just say, yeah, you know, let me let me get up and pray for him. So after he was done with his set, and uh, after the father was done with his set, uh, the two of them were just standing there. And so I got up and I talked to them. And I, I said to the son, I said, uh, so your shoulder hurts? And he said, yeah. And I said, do you believe in miracles? I qualify people. In fact, I'm going to give you another testimony that happened just an hour ago. So I qualify people because there's so much unbelief in this world and in this nation particularly that I now qualify people everywhere I go. And even though this young man, he looked like he was like 16, 17 years old, very, very respectful young man. I could, I saw the love of God in both their faces. They were definitely believers and sure enough they were. And, but nevertheless, I still qualify everybody now. I, I said, do you believe, do you believe in Jesus? And do you believe in miracles? And he said, yes, sir, I do. He even said, sir, because you know, he's young, I'm 59. And, uh, and so the father is intrigued and he, and, uh, because, you know, he's a believer, so he's got a great attitude. And, uh, and so I pray for the young, the young man and he's completely healed. He, he's like, it feels great. It, it just like it, it's amazing it feels great and then he was working out and then like even like a half hour later i saw him again he, was, he had been working out through all that and he goes yep it feels great amazing <clears throat> you know and so so like uh where was i going with that i guess i was just making a point that i qualified people <clears throat> excuse me about an hour ago i'm in the supermarket getting food and uh I see an elderly man walking towards me. His wife goes by me, and then he's walking towards me, and he's limping. In fact, first I was ahead of them, and then I turned around to go back to another section of the store, and then as I turn around, she passes me, and then I see him walking and limping and holding onto his side of his leg. And so I was like, the man looks, he looks like a nice guy, but he's in his, like, 70s. I got to stop and ask him. So I said, you, your leg is hurt. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's hurt. And uh, I said, you know, I'm a minister. I pray for people. I tell him the whole thing. And uh, he looks like he's in a hurry because he's going to catch up to his wife. I just felt like his wife was lording it over him, which really, really irritates me big time when I see that because I see that more often than I wish I care to admit. And so um, he seems like he's in a hurry. So he's kind of like, even though he's a very nice guy, you know, I'm still qualifying him because he seems like he's rushing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like chasing people with this. And so I said, do you, you believe in miracles? He goes, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you. I can pray for you right now. And like so many other people, when, when they hear that Christians that are not exposed to the ministry of the spirit, uh, when they hear something like that, they think that, oh, this is a whole to do, you know, like, like you're about to like spend the next 15 minutes with me. <laughs> you know, they don't realize it's like, no, this could be like 10 seconds, you know, but that's what they think automatically. They have preconceived notions as what's going to go on. And so he's like, ah, he goes, oh, I got to get, I got to get with my wife here. And I was like, I said, it won't take long. And uh, he goes, eh, that's all right. And, 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 uh, and so he just left. And so like, but I was like, and so, like, I qualified him. It's like I'm not, I'm not chasing people because I see so much of this unbelief in this nation and in the world too. And so, like, it's just really a sad thing. And so, so the apostles at that point they had hardened their hearts. And so we got, to, we have to be careful not to harden our hearts. We have to believe the scriptures with all of our hearts. Uh, and we have to be, we have to be, we remain tender hearted. We have to be ready for the Lord's discipline and correction, because we don't, because if we don't, if we're sinning against the Lord, like I said earlier, if, we, if we're sinning against the Lord, we're going to be experiencing discipline and correction from the Lord. And if we harden our hearts, it, it's, it's bad. We're, in fact, if you harden your heart, you're not even, you're going to come to the point where you're not even realizing that you're sinning against the Lord, because you're at that point, you're rejecting the correction of the Lord and you're, you're just totally off course. And so, so it's very important. And it's, uh, it's amazing. We can't let, we can't be uh, um, overly amazed. That's another point I wanted to make about this is that the, the apostles, after the storm and, and, the, and Jesus walking on water, the apostles are like amazed beyond measure. And I think that's a problem also. We can't be amazed beyond measure. We, we, we absolutely need to be amazed and we give God glory when we're just like in awe of him. But if Jesus is teaching us that this is for us also, we can't be amazed beyond measure to the point where 
we're, we're so intimidated. We're, we're thinking that, oh, I could never do anything like that. Right? You understand that? We, we have to have this understanding of who we are in Christ that this is for us also and that we can operate in this. And so we just have to, you have to believe if you're, if you're a spirit-filled born-again Christian, uh, you have power in you to operate in the miraculous. And if you identify as Christian and you don't think you have the spirit or don't think you need the spirit, you are in big trouble. You're, you're doomed. You're doomed. You're not going to make it because the Holy Spirit is the one who makes you a new creation. He's the one that circumcises your heart and makes you born again. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Born again is not a denomination. When I first became born again, there were plenty of Roman Catholics that I came across who did not consider themselves born again because, because they didn't understand the teaching. They thought born again meant a different denomination. It is not a different denomination. There are born again Roman Catholics, without a doubt, and they're born again believers in every denomination. I don't know why there still remains denominations. That's a different whole video. <laughs> but nevertheless, there are denominations because of disagreements. But, uh, but nevertheless, born again is not a denomination. You must be born again. Like John 3 says, John 3, 3, you know, where, John, where Jesus said it to Nicodemus, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, anyway, that's the whole kit and caboodle there of what I wanted to share. And I hope that it, it helps you and I hope it, it's enlightening. You can check all that out in scripture. And, uh, and a couple of other things before I go. I have uh, in the links in the description box, the description section of this of the, this video and all my videos. There's a link to the website called RoboxChurch.com. There's also links for donating if the Spirit is leading you to do that. And there's also links uh, in for uh, for uh, uh, the tele uh, the Telegram channel that I started. I have a Telegram channel. There's a link to that uh, if you want to join the Colorado Walk Church Telegram group where I just post stuff that's not on the YouTube channel often. So I'll, I'll, I'll post the YouTube videos there, but I also put other things on, on that Telegram page that I don't put on YouTube. And, uh, so, and then also there's, uh, there's the Zoom meeting that Ahava and I do uh, once a month, usually, usually the first Saturday of each month. Sometimes it's the second Saturday of the month where we, we facilitate we host and facilitate a Zoom meeting. You're free to join it if you want. And there's a, an email address in the description section. Uh, Eventscardboardboxchurch.com Event, Events Cardboard Box Church. Uh, go, go in the description section. You'll see that email address. Send, send an email to that email address if you want to join the Zoom meeting. And my wife Ahava will send you a reply with the link and the password to join the meeting. Uh, don't send an email to other email addresses like carboboxchurch at gmail.com because then all I'm going to do is tell you to send an email to the other email address <laughs> in order to get a hobby to send you the link and the password. Because a number of people have done that in the past. They've sent an email to my email address and, and that's what I do. I just send, all right, well, do me a favor, send an email to this address. So that's in the description section also. And also, uh, because of YouTube censoring me, if you like this video, click like and then, uh, and then share it if you want. And then also click, uh, tap on the, uh, the notification bell so you get updates on when the, the next video is. And also subscribe if YouTube unsubscribed you because that's the main thing that they're doing to me. They're unsubscribing people from my channel. So I've been stuck at, I've been stuck at a certain number of subscribers for three and a half years now, stuck at like 19,000 and something for three and a half years because 10 people will subscribe to me and then YouTube will unsubscribe 10 people. And it goes on and on and on year after year. They're criminals because they're censoring Christian content. But anyway, if you do all those things with liking and, and all that stuff for me, and, and uh, then maybe that'll counter some of the, the criminal activity of these people. So God bless you. Thanks for watching.